Uh, we're pleased to have Maziar over Zoom. Uh, professor Maziar Raisi is a professor at uh, Colorado, and he'll be talking to us about um, physics in four neural networks. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction uh, and for the invitation, actually. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about two topics. One of them has to do with external flows and actually designing uh, super cavitating hydrofoils. These are the, these hydrofoils that you see here. They're going to enable the vessel to go really fast. And it, it's going fast because it is basically flying in air rather than water. Because of the speed, you are creating vapor around uh, those hydrofoils. The other one is about uh, brain aneurysm, which could rupture and it could be uh, life-threatening. Uh, I hear some background noise. Maybe I hear some echo. Maybe one of the microphones is still on. Uh, let me try to. Okay, perfect. And by the way, I see the chat. If there are any questions, you can type them at any moment. Um, so yeah, one of them is about external flows. The other one is about internal flows. Here's a table of content of what we are going to be seeing today. I'm going to be spending around nine slides on the background of AI for science, of what are the current state of the arts, and what are the challenges. Then I'm going to spend around six slides on design optimization, which was exactly the project that I mentioned for external flows and the marine vessel. The other one is about brain aneurysm. It's another big project. So we are going to spend around 10 slides on that, six slides on some miscellaneous projects, one about high dimensional PDEs, three slides about discovering new physics, and then some uh, concluding remarks, three slides on that. So let's start with the background. Uh, the type of physics or prior knowledge or inductive bias or invariances, equivalencies that I'm going to be talking about in this talk, uh, they are not of the form that you see on this slide. They are not about images, they are not about text, and they are not about generative models. But I'm including this slide here because there is physics even in our images, even in our text. For instance, if you take this container ship, uh, shift it to the left, up, down, or uh, in any other direction that you like, it still needs to be classified as a container ship. And this is one of these, the, one of the equivalencies and invariances that uh, CNNs leverage to give us uh, really good results. But the story here is if you have enough data, you can learn those invariances, the physics, from the data. But in scientific computing, we have less data, and therefore we have to be, we have to work a little bit harder when we are designing our neural networks, when we are designing our loss functions. If you are interested in this, these sorts of topics, I have a two semester long course on applied deep learning. In the first part, in the fall semester, I usually talk about computer vision, including topics such as classification, uh, semantic segmentation, pose estimation, object detection, and even going to videos and 3D type of data. In the second half of the course, I usually talk about natural language processing, multimodal learning, where you are combining images and text or images, speech, and text. Then I talk about generative models like GANs and diffusion type of models. Then some advanced topics like self-supervised learning, contrastive learning. Then we go to speech and music, reinforcement learning, graph neural networks, recommender systems, and computational biology. What I'm going to be focusing mostly on today is about AI for science and about uh, 
videos and 3D type of data. But if you're interested in, in other topics in deep learning, this is a course that is relatively well received by the community. The type of physics that I'm gonna be talking about are the type of physics that have been around for a very long time. For instance, the Navier-Stokes equations. And there are actually university departments or even companies dedicated to these sorts of equations. You can use them for climate modeling, for designing airplanes, cars, or even uh, internal medicine. Here are, the, here are the equations. You have the continuity equation, you have the momentum equation, and these equations uh, get really hard when you're working with high Reynolds number. In a non-dimensional form, if you write Navier-Stokes equations, the Reynolds number is gonna have is gonna have something to do with the viscosity of the fluid and uh, the geometry, the shape of the objects that you're dealing with. And in those cases, uh, people typically don't solve Navier-Stokes equations unless they want to generate data for uh, RANs for uh, a really accurate type of data that you see. So for those, you are gonna need supercomputers and people usually don't solve that. What people usually do is they're gonna go and deal with uh, the averaged version or average solutions to Navier-Stokes equations because you want to know what are the average behavior. You don't want to know all of the detailed fluctuations and one way of doing it is you are going to write your solution as the average solution plus the fluctuations. You take that, you plug it inside Navier-Stokes equations, and then you are going to rewrite your equations in terms of these average terms. And if we were lucky, all of these equations would have only the bars in them or the variables including the averages, but we are unlucky and we are going to end up with these extra terms. And there are actually physics around and intuition around how you're going to actually close the model. Take these fluctuations or these extra terms in your equations and rewrite them in terms of the average terms. Uh, one of the most famous ones is this Businex eddy viscosity hypothesis. And you're going to be using a turbulence eddy viscosity and a turbulence kinetic energy. This is K and nu is your turbulence eddy viscosity. And now you can see everything is in terms of uh, U bars. There is this K and nu that uh, nu is going to be a function of K and some dissipation. And you're going to have the standard K epsilon type of model. And there is an equation for K, there is another equivalent equation for epsilon. And these are the equations that people typically solve in the high Reynolds regime. So what makes Navier-Stokes difficult is high Reynolds and actually the geometry of the objects that we're dealing with. The example that I showed you has a little bit more complexity. It's the vessel is going really fast. It's creating vapor around those uh, hydrofoils. And to model the vapor, you're going to add a scalar that is going to have its own equation. And that scalar is going to balance the trade of being in a liquid mode or being, a, being in a vapor mode. So basically being air or uh, water. And then all you're gonna be doing is modifying your density. And these are, if you want to know more about these sorts of topics, this is a good paper to refer to. <clears throat> Another class of equations that have their own departments, their own companies around them and built around them is uh, the ones that are multi-atom, multi-electron Schrodinger equation. 
and it has applications when you're dealing with renewable energy like uh, hydrogen storage or batteries of the future. What are the equations? These are the equations. Now this time we are dealing with an eigenvalue problem. You are going to have some wave functions describing the electron states. And actually this psi doesn't have any particular physical meaning. It's really hard to describe it. But if you take the absolute value, square it, that's going to have the meaning of the probability or probability distribution. And this is going to tell you where the electrons are spending most of their time. And that's going to give you the distribution of that. People usually write down the uh, H is the Hamiltonian, and they're going to use the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And that is basically telling us that the protons are too large compared to the electrons. So we are going to assume them to be a static. And then only the electrons are moving around. T is the kinetic energy. V is the potential energy because of the external field, because of the nuclei, which are positively charged. And then you're going to have this electron-electron interaction energy, which makes solving Schrodinger equation difficult in the first place. To deal with that, similarly, uh, to the, similar to the case of the Navier-Stokes equations, when we rarely solve the Navier-Stokes equations for higher Reynolds number, it's a similar story here. We rarely solve Schrodinger equations, only for simpler cases where you have n being small number of your electrons. You, you, you will try to work with the density or the electron density instead, and that's going to give you density functional theory. You are going to write down the cone sham equations, and it turns out that if you solve for these orbitals, if you solve for phi i's, you can get your psi back. And if you know your psi, you can get phi i's back. So at this point, you haven't lost much. There is no approximation yet. The electron density is the summation of these psi, the, these orbital squares. And uh, here is where the approximation comes in. You have your Vs, which is your effective single particle potential, is a result of some external potential. That one is fine. Plus our n, which we are trying to solve for. And what makes it difficult is this exchange correlation potential. And this is where people get ad hoc. Now you're going to get approximations to Schrodinger equation, and that's going to give you a whole new field of density functional theory. And here you have a family of models that you can choose, like local density approximation, which is only a function of n, or you can go higher order. It's as if you're doing higher order Taylor expansions or you can include gradients of n. There are actually ways of solving those equations using deep learning. You can approximate psi, which was your wave function, with a deep neural network. That deep neural network could be physics informed on its own, like respecting the Slater determinants. It has multi-determinant expansion, and you name it. Your loss function is also coming out of you trying to solve an eigenvalue problem. And you can rewrite it in the variational formulation. And then you are solving an optimization problem. And as soon as you have an optimization problem, then you can do your gradient descent techniques. Another class of equations that are really useful. For instance, uh, you can find their applications in material science, designing new materials, in protein folding or protein dynamics, DNA, et cetera, is trying to solve molecular dynamic equations. You have n particles, 
Each particle has a mass. It has the corresponding location at time t, the velocity, and the acceleration of the particle. What you do is you write down the Taylor series expansion of the location of the particles for t plus delta t, t minus delta t. And then uh, take the terms to one side, create uh, these accelerations. And then you are going to relate acceleration to the forces that you have using Newton's second law. So the equations are really simple here. Now, what you're going to end up with is this equation that you're going to be solving in an iterative fashion. <laughs> and your F is usually coming out of a potential. And this is the landscape of your uh, energy potential. And then you have a family of what type of U you want to use, like pair potential, multi-body potential, reactive potentials, or the type of potentials that come from quantum mechanics, from solving uh, density, from density functional theory, the one that I just explained. But what makes molecular dynamics difficult is not the equations that you're solving, is actually for a very long time when you're solving these equations, for a very long time, for many time steps, nothing happens. And then suddenly the, inter the interesting things happen. Suddenly the protein folds and then unfolds. And then goes from one state to the next state. And there are actually methods to accelerate the solution uh, to those sorts of techniques, to those sorts of uh, problems. One of them is VAP net type of ideas. And the other one is this Boltzmann generator that I want to refer. These are not my work, but it's a good idea to know about them. Another class of uh, equations that are really important, and there are actually companies around them, uh, are Maxwell's equations. These are the equations in terms of the electric field and the magnetic field. We're going to have the Gauss law, for magnetism, Faraday's law, Ampere's law, in vacuum, the equations are going to simplify. And in the end, once you do some uh, simple arithmetic on the equations, you're going to end up with wave equation. So you might say, so what is difficult about solving wave equation? These are just simple second order partial differential equation. What makes solving these equations difficult is the actual geometry. You want to do communication from one tower to somebody's cell phone, and then it has to go through the geometry of a city or the geometry of the building. And this is what makes solving these equations difficult, the geometry itself, not the equations. This is why people start with simplified scenarios and they stop there. What's gonna happen in the next level of complexity is you do ray tracing as a means of an approximate solution to Maxwell's equations, or you can go the statistical route. You're gonna say that when you're communicating from one point to another point, the signal is gonna go through uh, different phase shifts and different amplitudes and once you write down your uh, write down your equations in terms of the taps, these are the units of uh, communication, then you're going to end up with some channel which you need to est estimate. And uh, you can make statistical assumptions on that using the law of large numbers. And the central limit theorem, you can assume that H is normally distributed and your noise is normally distributed. And then you're gonna have your statistical techniques. So what is the message here? We rarely solve uh, our equations and these equations actually are really powerful. And 
we have already solved the physics of the problem to some extent. And now it's a matter of solving these equations, which uh, makes them challenging. That was a little bit about the background. Now let's move towards the design optimization problem and focus uh, more on the techniques. This is the design optimization problem. We want to design the super cavitating hydrofoils, these hydrofoils here that are gonna uh, help the vessel go super fast in water. Here are some typical uh, solutions. These are coming out of uh, the solver that I just explained. It's an extension of open foam. It's a Reynolds average solver. And uh, you can actually verify that, that the solution that you get out of your solver matches the solution that comes out of uh, experiments. So it matches real data. Once you're satisfied, you go and uh, create your geometry. Around the geometry, you need to create a mesh. You have to be really careful about the mesh. The mesh uh, should have uh, low resolution near the object. And then you can have higher resolution far away from the object itself because the interesting things happen near the object. Once you do that, then you're ready to call the solver, the navier stokes solver. And as soon as you do that, this is a 2D cross-section of the same geometry. So you're creating a 2D cross-section. Once you solve your equations in a numerical fashion, you're gonna end up with the quantity that you're interested in, lift over drag. Now you can start generating data out of the solver, but the solver is really slow. It takes around six hours to give you the solution, even if, even in the case that you have your mesh in place, the geometry is already meshed. But this is actually where we are gonna put our machine learning uh, surrogate. You have a geometry, you can parameterize it. Given those parameters, you can generate data out of this process. This is the input, that's the output. And you want to build a surrogate for this function. And this is where machine learning can help us. And this type of machine learning surrogate modeling knows nothing about the physics. The data is physics informed, but the machine learning technique that you're gonna be using, we can apply it on any data, including the data that is coming out of a physical model. And you can actually do Bayesian optimization. And why would you do Bayesian optimization? Because you are trying to design uh, your hydrofoil. At the same time, you want to be as data efficient as possible. And this is where the uncertainty in Gaussian processes can help us explore the space in a smarter way. We don't need to simulate all of the cases in this high dimensional space. We just need to simulate the cases that are interesting. And it's gonna happen in an iterative fashion. And you're maximizing lift over drag or equivalently you can minimize drag over lift. There is actually a growing literature around the surrogate modeling aspect of uh, AI for science. And actually they call it PDE solvers, which is not true. You are not solving your PDEs. You're creating a surrogate for the underlying data that is generated from a PDE solver. So these types of techniques are gonna be as good as the data, as good as the underlying solvers. And these are some extensions of the same work. And uh, you probably have heard of this uh, Fourier neural operator and the literature around it. And uh, I guess the newest one is this Clifford neural layers. And these are in the realm of surrogate modeling. Let's move on to brain aneurysm problem and let's try to incorporate physics explicitly in our equations. And uh, let's see what happens. 
And let's start with a challenging problem. Uh, this is the brain aneurysm. Let's say the data that you have is this video on the left. And what you have is at this point in time, at this location in the space, you have the concentration of the dye that is injected in somebody's arteries to visualize the artery and then do the imaging. We can think of this similar to MNIST, but this is actually a video and it's 3D data. And it's similar to MNIST in the sense that you are dealing with images that have a single channel. They are not colorful. You have this C that is a, a constant from zero up until one. And from that, we want to know the velocity field inside the aneurysm. And why is that important? Because as soon as we know that, we can give the doctors more information of what is, what is the shear stress on the wall of the aneurysm. What are the likelihoods of this aneurysm rupturing? So today, what the doctors have is this image on the left. We want to give them more information, more quantitative information. The image on the left is telling the doctors that there is an aneurysm. The aneurysm is this big. It's not telling them in which portion of the uh, aneurysm there is the most pressure and it's most likely to rupture. In the end of the day, the input to the algorithm is this concentration or at this point in time, at this point in the space, you have the corresponding concentration and the output of the algorithm is the velocity field. And as soon as you know the velocity field and the pressure, you can compute the shear stress. And this is just a post-processing step. Now let's put our deep learning hats on. Somebody might say use 3D convolutions. Somebody might say use point net. Somebody might say because you're dealing with uh, 3D data, perhaps ideas from LiDAR type of data are gonna be helpful to you and use point net, point net plus plus, DGCNN, or even these days transformers because you're dealing with a set of points. But before we rush into choosing an architecture to solve this problem, let's take a closer look at the data. This is our input data. This is our out output data. To train any machine learning technique, we need to collect a lot of them. It means that we need to collect multiple geometries from multiple different patients, perhaps add to that some uh, simulated data so that you have enough data to work with, enough training data to perhaps train uh, point net architecture. But the major issue here is we have small m. We don't have enough m. Think about it at the extreme. We cannot even collect thousands. We can collect around one or two. And we actually have one data point that we're gonna be testing it for. We're gonna be using it for test data rather than training on it. So we have a small m problem. And uh, to find a solution, somebody might say, don't use deep learning. Wait for enough time, perhaps in the future, you have enough data, and then you can train your deep learning model. Somebody might say, go ahead and collect more data. And that one also requires new technology, a lot of people to be collaborative, willing to share their medical records. And that leads to these privacy concerns. And somebody might say, if you have privacy concerns because you are working with medical data, perhaps federated learning is gonna help you, which is the idea that you don't need to uh, transfer data from the user to a cloud. You can transfer the weights of your model back and forth. You can do, somebody might say, do semi-supervised learning. But here the problem is even the input, we don't have many of them. Semi-supervised learning type of ideas are useful when you have a lot of perhaps unlabeled images or unlabeled text. 
here it means unlabeled input here we don't even have enough uh, inputs input data uh, therefore ideas such as transfer learning are not going to help us if you want to go from a super self-supervised learning to a downstream task somebody might say use simulated data this is actually a good idea and we are going to explore it and see what we get but there is a catch with that there is this reality gap that we need to close simulated data is going to have a different distribution from the real data and there are actually ways of dealing with them like domain adaptation domain randomization let's try to test that idea further and even if we manage to train a deep neural network, even if we manage to deal with this small M problem somehow, there is this question of trust and robustness. Do we really trust going under a surgery because a deep neural network told us to go under the surgery? And at the same time, we know that these neural networks are not robust. If you take the input, shift it a little bit in an adversarial fashion, they're going to give you a totally different output. They're going to classify cats and dogs, cats as dogs. So we have to be careful with uh, the method that we are trying to come up with. Let's test this idea of simulated data more. People do this all the time. In robotics, they also have a small data problem, especially if they want to work with uh, robots in the real world or in an experimental setting what people usually do is they do test their ideas in a simulated environment like open ai gym and then do domain adaptation or even for self-driving cars we are not going to trust the car driving on its own on our roads it's dangerous it's costly we test the ideas in a simulated environment but somebody might say, if you are doing simulation for your problem, just simulate once and uh, get a solution out of your method. You are dealing with Navier-Stokes equations, just solve them using scientific computing. Let's see if, what are the challenges there for this problem. First of all, we need to extract the geometry from the patient. This is going to take some time and effort. We are going to need to mesh the geometry. And this is where we are going to need an expert in the loop. These are highly trained people uh, creating meshes. So creating mesh is not only about the science of meshing, it's also an art. So let's even assume that you have your mesh in place. We can run the Navier-Stokes perhaps your favorite Navier-Stokes solver, perhaps open foam, Nectar++, plus plus, you name it. And this is going to take you around uh, six hours to finish or 48 hours to finish your Navier-Stokes solver. Now the question is, what are your boundary conditions? The input to the Navier-Stokes solvers are the boundary conditions and the initial conditions. And this is challenging. We need to look at the big picture here. This is the aneurysm cut from the left eye of a person from their interior, from their entire arterial system. Now the question is, what are you gonna put as boundary condition here at the outlet and as the inlet? And this is where we are gonna come up with some ad hoc methods for solving that, or you can approach it in a systematic fashion. You can say that, what about we run the, Nav we run the Navier stock solver multiple times with different inlet and outlet conditions and choose the one that matches the pattern from the data. So we keep modifying inlet and outlet, we keep, um, doing remeshing, run the navier stokes solver until we reach a solution that has a low error compared to the ground truth. That's an option, but uh, to give you an idea, 
if you want to back propagate your errors and keep modifying even the inlet and the outlet, each forward solve is going to take you 48 hours. Now you need to do that for multiple, for thousands or millions of iterations to modify the inlet and the outlet. So it's going to be thousands and millions times 48 hours. It is definitely beyond my perhaps lifetime. So that's not a solution. Fortunately, we were working on some ideas from physics informed deep learning. Uh, so we were trying to devise a method that can not only solve forward problems, but inverse and data simulation problems and model discovery type of problems. And this is the story of, if you have enough data, you can learn your physics, therefore you are discovering your physics. If you are dealing with small data, you need to make more assumptions about the physics of the system. You need to know your equations. And there are some cases which are my favorite, it is the cases where you have moderate sized data and then uh, you know your equations up until some parameters. And these are the type that we saw when we were trying to close Navier-Stokes, where you had those uh, fluctuations, we wanted to close them as a function of the uh, mean field. And the idea of physics-informed neural networks is very easy. This is actually where things started. And the idea is that the derivative of a neural network is a neural network. It's going to have a computational graph. The computational graph of a derivative of a function is going to share the same parameters with the function itself. It's going to have perhaps different activation functions. And it's perhaps uh, going to have twice the size, if twice the length, or twice the depth if you are doing uh, back propagation to compute your derivatives. But in the end of the day, you have a neural network and you can train it. And this is the idea. Let's see. Let's go back to our uh, case where we had data on the concentration. Now we can write down and our architecture in a slightly different way. People in reinforcement learning do this all the time. You take your input variable, which we are assuming C to be an input, the concentration of a die. We put it as the output. Now we want to train this neural network. And the only data that we have is on the concentration. Now the points in a single point cloud is going to give us our training data. And uh, these are the different points. And you're doing a regression on one of the heads. The problem is you don't have any observations on U, V, W, and P. How do you compensate for that? You have equations. You have the first equation that is telling you that the concentration of a die is getting advected by the flow, is getting pushed by the flow and it's diffusing by a non-dimensional or non-dimensionalized uh, diffusion coefficient. The equations two, three, and four are the momentum equations. And equation five is the continuity. Mass is not gonna appear or disappear out of nowhere. It's just gonna get transported from one location to another location. You write down this last function the last function on the right, you don't need to have any labels on your data because the label you already know, you want to make these equations zero. All you need to have is some inputs in your space. So you're gonna put some points and scatter them in the space. These are your collocation points and you try to make equations as zero as possible. And out of that optimization process, the solution comes up. This is the underlying solution. This is the benchmark. This is the ground truth. And this is the prediction of the model. The one on the left is the ground truth. Now the question is, how robust is this method 
to we know that it's really data efficient we want to know how data efficient are you in terms of the resolution so i need to bring an anal analogy here let's assume that actually what we are doing is let's assume your problem is you want to come up with a classifier that is learned that is trained with only a single image now you are playing around with the resolution of that single image and you are making it lower and lower resolution so we are taking data efficiency to the extreme and that data efficiency is coming from the physics of the problem from our assumptions we play around with the resolution in time with the resolution in space and the method is pretty robust up until around 20 time steps and 500 for the resolution in space and uh, to come up with these results i had 16 gpus in front of me so i said i'm gonna fire all of them at the same time and then it's going to give me the result and it's going to give me i was looking for a failure case because as soon as you have your failure case you can publish your paper you're going to make the reviewers happy and it didn't happen so i had to fire up 16 other gpus so that i have enough cases so that i see this pattern that the method is finally breaking how robust is the method to noise it's the same story you keep adding noise to the concentration data at some point it is basically uh, noise compared to the signal it's high noise to signal ratio and i had the same problem i fired up 16 gpus with 30 percent noise and this is a relative noise relative to the size of the variable these are not absolute noise if the variable is bigger this is relative to the size of that variable if it is smaller it is relative to that size the method didn't fail it didn't fail with 16 other gpus 16 other gpus 16 other gpus 16 other gpus and then i gave up i said uh, these are the results and reported them in the paper in terms of uh, the convergence pattern of these physics informed deep learning type of ideas physics informed neural networks you are going to notice this pattern a lot that the method and throughout the optimization throughout the training you are going to go to zero the loss function for your equations and then it's going to escape it and find another local minima and there is a strong reason for this is that if you look at the Navier-Stokes equations any zero any constant function is a solution to Navier-Stokes so initially the method is going to find the easy cases and then it's going to escape it to match the pattern in the data in terms of other projects so from this point on things are going to be quick we can apply the same methodology to external flows and this is useful when you're designing your airplanes in an air tunnel you're gonna uh, put smoke in the room measure the density of the smoke and from that you can compute lift over drag and lift and drag coefficients you can deal with cases where you have multi-physics you have the physics of the fluid physics of the solid fluid structure interaction type of problems and they are going to be useful uh, because of cases like the tacoma narrow bridge collapse this is where the solid is interacting with the fluid you can couple odes and pdes so the dynamics of the particles are governed by the odes at the bottom the dynamics of the PD is the ones above, and then you can couple them. You can extend this to complex, more complex geometries. This is what happens if somebody coughs in an airplane, where are the aerosols going? 
where the particle is going. We can apply similar type of techniques for doing turbulence scalar mixing. Turbulence is difficult because even if you solve on the same computer with the exact same setup, you're gonna end up with a different solution each time that you do your simulation because of the numerical errors. So somebody might say, perhaps it's a better idea to look at the probability distribution on the trajectories. Perhaps you're not looking for the trajectories themselves, but looking at the probability distribution of the trajectories. Then that probability distribution is a simpler function that you can approximate with a deep neural network. And this is exactly what we did. This is the probability distribution on the concentration of the uh, plot that you see on the left, left top. What we had was a very similar problem. You have the input, you have your output, which is the probability density, which is this form. And then you have no data on D. But that's okay because you can actually compensate for that by writing an equation. So if you look at this paper and the one that we are citing there, there is a lot of math taking you from the figure on top. It's around 50 pages of rigorous math, taking you from the figure on the top to the figure on the bottom. With deep neural network, this is what we are doing. This is just our objective function and we are solving for D. It's an inverse problem now. Let's move on to high dimensional PDEs. And these types of PDEs show up when you're doing asset pricing. Perhaps you want to know the price of an option on 100 assets, or when you're doing control, stochastic control. You can relate the forward, backward stochastic differential equation and some high dimensional PDE with a theorem. The theorem is not mine. It tells us that the solution to the stochastic ODE is related to the PDE through these relationships. So Y is the backward dynamics, is gonna be a function and this function solves this PDE, is gonna be a function of X, the forward dynamic, and there is this Z that is giving you a drift. And to make sure that things are making sense. You have your phi function here, the same phi show up here. You have mu, it's the same mu, and you have the same sigma showing up in both of the equations. But as soon as I see this relationship, I see there is a function, we can approximate it with a deep neural network. And something for free you are gonna get out of it is that the derivative of the neural network we can compute it using automatic differentiation. And these are going to share parameters. And then you can solve high dimensional Black Scholes and high dimensional Hamilton Jacobi Perlman equation. The cool thing here is the loss function is coming out of uh, the forward and discretizing the stochastic ODE. It's going to be a complicated looking loss function. So I'm not writing it here on this slide. You can find it in the paper. But in, in the end of the day, we don't really, it doesn't really matter how complex that last function is. In the end, it's coming out of discretizing this ODE. And in the end, it's giving us the solution that we want. Okay. Let's move on to discovering new physics. And let's just start with ODEs. We can say that X dot is equal to F of X and you want to know what is your F. Similar story to the one from the previous slide. We can discretize this ODE using the trapezoid rule. So XN minus one divided by XN is what you get on the right. And uh, similar to the chaotic system, there is no hope for us to get every single trajectory of the Lorentz system accurately. 
because this is a chaotic system, but we can get the big picture. What are the attractors? Or you can apply to hop bifurcation where you have no dynamics on mu. You can apply to Navier-Stokes equations projected on 3D in a 3D space, or you can apply to glycolytic oscillators. And we have some works for uh, COVID-19 and the equations for SIR type of equations. You can extend those, those types of frameworks to discovering PDEs. These are infinite dimensional dynamical systems. And what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be approximating you with a neural network. You're gonna be approximating the dynamic with yet another neural network. You're gonna create the residual. And then we are gonna put that in a loss function, similar to what we were doing with pins. Now we are, this is physics informed, but we don't know the physics. We are trying to discover it. This is a physics informed loss where we don't know N. And that's gonna be useful in the cases where you want to extrapolate or when you want to change your initial condition to some other initial condition and make sure that what you actually learned, the physics that you learned actually makes sense, or you can discover other types of equations. And there is actually a literature, it started here in 2018, and there is a literature following this type of paradigm. And this is one of the most recent ones where you are combining uh, physics informed type of ideas with the type of idea where you're putting a neural network on your uh, dynamic, on the equations that you want to learn. And then you can uh, write down your loss function, optimize it, and then it turns out that this parameter lambda here is going to tell you whether you're learning non-conservative physics, whether you're learning new physics. It goes through a bifurcation when you're actually learning something new. But this is not my work, but it's a work that I'm excited about for the future. In terms of concluding remarks, what can we do in the future? As we saw these partial differential equations or ordinary differential equations, they become difficult along two axes. One of the axes is the physics axis. We can deal with more complex physics like non-Newtonian fluids or even the type of physics that we don't even know, like the type of physics for climate modeling. And another axis is the geometry axis. For instance, the geometry of the airplane becomes very difficult or the geometry of our cities, our buildings. And to the far right is where you see not only a complex physics because of the high Reynolds number, but also complex geometry. And the idea is to take these types of frameworks apply them in the face of more challenging problems, they're gonna break. And once they break, the idea is to fix them. And then you're gonna end up with um, new techniques. If you need more information, I'm putting my videos online. You can take a look at them. I can also share the slides with you if you're interested. And all of the codes are online. I don't have any mathematical proofs for why things work but all I can do is share the codes so that the results are reproducible. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Maziar. Let's uh, maybe <laughs> upload again because the, the mic was not on. So do you hear me well? Do you hear us well, Professor Maziar? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so now we will... We have time for uh, some questions. I can yes, maybe I'll start go. with the question, uh, Professor. Uh, so uh, in the example you, you gave, uh, the first one, maybe the, the, so how, I don't understand how different are the prediction cases uh, with the testing cases. What, what are things that you change in the, like the predi prediction cases? Can we change the geometry or the, the 
the, the model's parameters, physical parameters? Yeah, this is actually a good one. Uh, the geometry is fixed, but it doesn't mean that the method cannot work with new geometries because it is actually geometry independent. And we are using zero training data and we are using one test data and this, we are using this as our test data. The other thing about the parameters of the PDE, we are learning them on the fly. So this peck len number, the Reynolds number, uh, these are two additional parameters on top of the parameters of this gray box, this gray neural network on the left. So it's gonna discover the right physics for this geometry, for this data, so that it matches that. Okay, thank you. We have a question here in the room. Yes. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you can hear me, huh? Yes, I do. Hello? Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so I, with my limited knowledge, I tend to not believe much on extrapolation and that whatever someone says extrapolation is some sort of disguised interpolation. But uh, when you say, yeah, exactly, yeah, for the neural dynamics, you say that you're able to do some extrapolation. What, what's, what's the assumption there? Like, what permits you to do extrapolation? So that's a good question. So what are we doing here? The data is collected from time zero up until time 6.2. It's uh, behind this uh, line, this vertical line. That's where the data is. From that data, we are gonna learn N. We are gonna learn some equation. Now the question is how do you test what you learn actually makes sense? because you don't know the exact formulas for that. You know that it's just a neural network. How do you make sure that what you learn is actually correct and it makes sense? What you can do is, you know the equations that you used on the left to give you the exact dynamics. You know your equations on the right, which is the learned equations where you have your neural network. We can de give these two equations the same initial and boundary conditions and solve them, solve both of them. You're gonna get two solutions. Now you can compare the solutions. Up until time 6.2, I would say there is nothing interesting. It is still an indication that you learned something about your physics. But then after that, you had no training data. It was just you forecasting the future. And this is where the interesting things happen. Even it is more interesting if you look at the cases where you're changing the initial condition totally to a totally different initial condition. That one is not even in your training data. And now you can see that uh, even if you change your initial condition, and you solve these two equations, you're gonna get the same pattern, the same solution. So it's a clear indication that the N, the physics that you learned is actually, uh, it makes sense. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, I have a simple question. So the PINS framework looks uh, uh, very um, good in principle, but in practice, some of the use cases, it doesn't work. For example, solutions having high regularities, like you know, discontinuous solutions, which often appear in the high probability PDEs. Um, do you have a comment on that? So I heard the first part of your question, but not the second part. So, so I was asking about the, the structure of the solution uh, and the convergence of neural networks. So if, you, if your solution is highly regular, that means it varies significantly, uh, do you think that neural networks will have a hard time converge to that? So yeah, this is, ex this is exactly what I mentioned here in terms of future work is 
this is a methodology that has been around, I would say, for a couple of years. And if you want to compare it to something like uh, finite elements that have been around for more than half a century or even a century, so it's not going to be a fair comparison. And this is exactly why I draw these two arrows. You are going to try a new geometry and new physics, and you're going to break pins. And once you break it, you're going to fix it. Okay, it's not going to be a solution for all of our problems. It's going to be a solution that is going to be evolving in time. And I can tell you where pins can break. And this is, we are having some new papers on that is when you're actually writing down your loss function. I don't think the problem is the neural network. The problem is this loss function and properly balancing the trade-off between minimizing one, one loss function versus another one. It's the balance, balancing the trade-off between fitting the data and fitting the equations. And for those, we need to do careful hyperparameter tuning or uh, we can come up with the scales of these equations from a new idea that we are working on. It's about using the time stepping type of ideas. That's going to give us the scales and then pins is going to converge relatively easily. So maybe one last question from the audience. Thank you, Professor. It was very simple your presentation. So I have one question about the physics here from Monaco. I, I find uh, some uh, packages uh, with the linear phase they work very well, but uh, for no, no linear examples, uh, they, they give uh, bad, bad results. I don't know if there is a, a model that we can use in, 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 in this case. If you have no model. Yeah, actually, for non the, the type of models that I'm talking about are all nonlinear. It's going to be u times ux. So this is a nonlinear uh, PD. So I don't think the issue is the nonlinearity. Uh, so I need to actually, perhaps we can set some time and walk through the problem that you're dealing with. So we can share your email maybe, Professor, to... Yeah, absolutely. So this is my so email. Let's thank Thanks. So let's thank, thank again, uh, Professor Maziar. Thank you a lot.